This podcast is part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, a program designed to help all podcasts reach their full potential. For information about joining the Robots Radio Rocket Club, check out robotsradio.net. Hey, all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about all things Dragon Age pertaining to its lore. You know, all the things that are mentioned in the intro of the show, all that great stuff. I am one of your hosts, Austin or Teacup, and I'm here with my other host. Yeah, I'm Shelby or Sheikup. Excited to be back. And we have a guest with us today to talk about our character deep dive. Yes, that's right. We are doing a character deep dive today. So our guest with us is Kolka Shins, who is one of our patrons and an active member of our Discord. Hello, happy to be here. Thanks for being here. So as we ask with all of our guests who come in, we kind of ask, what got you into Dragon Age? What keeps you in the games? What's something that you love about this world and these games? So I I forget exactly when I bought Dragon Age, but I bought, got Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2 at the same time. And I remember, I think I started playing Mass Effect 2 first. Um, but then when I really got into Dragon Age Origins and kind of got past, um, you know, Ostagar and stuff, I, I couldn't put it back down. And I keep coming back to each new game and I get, I get sucked into this lore because it's so, there's so much depth to it. And it's so complex. It's such, you know, it's great storytelling, not only, you know, the mythical aspects, but also, you know, human stories with it as well. I just, I can't ever put it down. And I have stuck with it over since Dragon Age Origins, essentially. It's such a good series. Like, I don't know. Sometimes you just don't have words for it. It's just good. So, Shelby, are you ready to talk about our character? Yeah, I'm super excited for our deep dive today. This is a character who I feel like doesn't get a lot of love. I don't, I don't feel like people hate her, but like no one's rabid over this character. You know, nobody's a simp for this one, but I do like her a lot. And I do feel like she is the, the game's mom or even grandmother. Um, so obviously we are talking about when today. So it's interesting that you say she's a character that doesn't get a lot of love, which I just realized this. Both the party members that we get that are circle mages are not romanceable. It's Vivian and Wynn. I guess that's true. And obviously if Bethany goes to the circle, that's your sibling. So yeah, you. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, technically in the circle, you're not supposed to have romances. So, but as a circle mage, you can romance other people. Like if you're the warden. Yes. And we do know that we'll get into this. Wynn and Vivian both break that rule. Yes, they do. All right. Are we ready to get into some fun facts? Yes. Yep. Okay. So when is a circle mage, obviously we just mentioned that from Dragon Age Origins, she is a potential companion in Origins. And I don't know about y'all, but I met when before she was a companion, I met her, you can meet her in Ostagar. She's there like part of the fight with the circle and so I met her, she's just standing beside a tree. And so then eventually when I went back um, in that first playthrough and went to the circle, I was like, oh, this lady, like I already met her. And then she became part of your party. So also um, when actually underwent her harrowing, like way before a lot of her peers. So she was, she was more advanced than some of the kids or teenagers, whatever, that were her age. Also, Wynne was nominated and asked to become the new first enchanter of the Ferelden Circle, but she turned it down due to not wanting to navigate the bureaucracy of the circles, which there, 
And shortly after, she then volunteered and went to fight at Ostagar. Additionally, when is written or was written by Cheryl Chi and Mary Kirby. So speaking of the author, this brings up an interesting point, um, something that is probably like the number one thing we talk about when when gets brought up in the fandom, and that's her age. When is supposed to be 50, right around 50 years old, which is totally inaccurate to her character design in the game. Um, and to to her lines that have been written for her. So I found I found a tweet on Twitter, obviously, from Cheryl Chi, um, who basically said that when she wrote when she was very young. So at that time, she was ignorant and thought that 50 years old was like ancient which we know is not accurate. So when, even though the lore says she's 50, is really supposed to be like a little bit older than that. She's definitely portrayed as a grandmotherly figure. Like she is the mom friend or the grandmom friend of the group. You know, she's the one that pulls aside the hero of Ferelden when they get into a romance and is like, have you thought this through? Like, are you sure? Like, what about your responsibility? She's the one that brings those kinds of things up. Yeah, my parents are both 60 and Wynn looks older than they do. I was actually going to point out something to the opposite of that because I feel like it would have made more sense if her actual character looked a little bit older than it does. I feel like it just, it's just gray hair and no wrinkles while she's talking about how she's just lucky to be alive it's an old bag of bones it's it's a weird juxtaposition for me at least it was originally no i agree with that um i do think she like her face does not have a lot of wrinkles she doesn't look she doesn't look that old she does look older than 50 but yeah i mean i don't think i don't know the way she talks like my grandmother who will turn 80 next year i think talks like that so i i just feel like she is written in her language to be older but then again she doesn't you're right it's just the gray hair like she just looks like a mom in her face if you just look at her face so it's kind of a weird um it's a weird situation perhaps the spoilers for later on perhaps the spirit of faith that is interacting with when gives her kind of an old soul old mind kind of mentality See, I thought you were going to say maybe the spirit gives her kind of a little facelift. I thought you were were saying the same thing. (laughs) Um, It's called a fade lift. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Boo. Well, let's move on to my last fun fact, which is that in banter with Ogren, which thinking about Ogren and Wynn being friends at all is like, no but anyway so in banter with Ogren, she basically tells him like i love good beer and ale and wine and Ogren essentially like loses his mind with happiness and is super surprised and is basically overjoyed that the grandma of the party likes to drink which is hilarious to me that's interesting why interesting just that of course that's the only like that's the banter that happens because the only time that I have Ogren in the party is in the deep roads. And of course, Wynn is there because who's going anywhere without Wynn? That's fair. Um, I thought you were going to say because Ogren's only personality trait is alcoholism. <laughs> that true, too. I feel like her being a, uh, a an alcohol connoisseur is very on point for her, though, because it's like getting into the older age of, you know, let your interests get more and more varied and specialized. Are we ready to talk about the bio? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Okay, so when is born sometime around 881, blessed, the blessed age. Before she went to the circle, when grew up in Ferelden, specifically in the Benorn, which is that kind of like middle fertile crescent area of Ferelden. There's a lot of agriculture. She was found alone as a very young, young child, like I'm thinking toddler, in a town slash farm named Langwin. So L-A-N-G, 
W-Y-N-N-E. This is also her namesake. Um, and she was found by a farmer's wife and her, her magical ability manifested as a response to being bullied. And so she grew up, well, she lived with this, this farm couple for a little bit. And then when her magical ability started, they sent her to Kenlock Hold, the circle and Ferelden. So she also is another one that went to the circles fairly young. We don't get an exact age as far as I'm aware of, but she does go to the circle fairly young. Wynn was an extraordinary student, a very great student, which I feel like she definitely gives off former A plus student vibes. She just, she just does. Um, I don't know how to explain it. She just does. But so she was very devoted to the circle for most of her life. She very much believes in what the circle stands for. And she very much is an advocate both of magic itself and for magic users to be trained to use their magic to then serve other people. She is not a mage that wants to gain power and status and nobility. Like she wants to use her magic to help other people, which I feel is obvious in her skill tree. Like she's all about healing. She's all about um, supporting the party. So as we know, because we've played the games, Wynne is a veteran of the Fifth Blight, and she is a companion to the hero of Ferelden. And like I mentioned earlier, we can meet her in two places, in Ostagar, as she's preparing to fight. Um, she does not join your party at this time, or you can meet her again during the circle quest. And then obviously we know that a demon outbreak has overcome the Ferelden circle and she's basically been forced to steal off the whole tower and she's trying to protect children. And it's only after this quest that Wynn joins the party permanently. Yes, Austin. Do we know how she survives Ostagar? No, we don't. It is a gap in the lore. Interesting. I was just thinking, because we like get explanations. So like Aveline and Carver, like they are able to just kind of escape the Darkspawn Horde because they were kind of at the back of the army a little bit. And right. So and I, I looked for the answer to this and I didn't find anything. So if anyone out there does know the answer to this question, um, please let me know. But my, my guess... Um, would be that the spirit inside of her is doing some heavy lifting at that point. She's also, she's not the only one of the, because uh, there are seven circle mages who are there at the Battle of Ostagar, which I think it's impressive in general that she's one of seven who went. Um, but at least one other of those mages, Aldred, who is oh, yeah. important to the circle quest line, he is also at the Battle of Ostagar. But I think by the sequence of what happens in the broken circle or the broken tower, that, that quest line, it may have been that he got back to the tower before her, which would suggest that they didn't escape together and might have been on different parts of the battlefield at the time. Yeah, and it, it would make sense for them to spread out the mages on the battlefield just from a tactics perspective. Right. Um, I guess this question, are we told how long you're unconscious in Flemeth's hut? I don't think so. What did they say? Like, I don't think they do. Yeah, I don't think they give a specific amount of time. We also wanted to talk about a few things that she has um, or that she, like items that she likes. So I'm going to turn that over to Cash. So, um, one of the first noteworthy things for me um, was the belt she starts out equipped with when you recruit her. Um, it's called the Silver Aaron. And I don't know whether Aaron is an actual thing or if that's a title for the belt, but the, uh, the wiki description for the belt is a small belt case with pages of a Tevinter manuscript that Wynne found meaningful at a difficult time. They list principles of the circle of Magi before public perception of magic was soured. So I think it's emblematic of, you know, Wynne is a very principled woman. She is very disciplined. She lives, I think, her life by a number of fairly rigid rules that can bend, but she doesn't generally break them. Um, and then with regard to her gifts, 
like Shelby was saying earlier, Wynn is a, uh, you know, an avid connoisseur of different alcohols and she, one of her gifts is wine, funny enough, but otherwise it's all books. She is an avid lover of books um, from the uses of dragon blood to an Orlesian romance novel about a noble woman and a chevalier and even a book exploring how Andraste may have been a powerful mage rather than the maker's chosen, which I think is a little bit funny. That is interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned that when is very, very principal. And I just am curious about like, I can't remember in Asunder, like, does she make it to 940 Dragon for the repeal of the Navarra Accords? Like, is she there with the Enchanters? voting to yeah. break away we'll get there later we'll talk about it later because i feel like and i can't remember what she does but i just feel like she would not she'd kind of be on vivian's side on this there is very specific reasons for the stance she ultimately takes at the end of asunder and the ultimate vote to break away from the chantry and also at the end of Asunder is one of the few examples that I could find in either in the games or in the in the books of when she really bends those those moral rules that she lives by. That and just completely ignoring if you're a mage using blood magic. That too. Yeah, well. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. The whole um end of asunder will be discussed at later in time <laughs> yeah i don't know if aaron is meant to be a name which is how i've always read it or if it's something else in the lore um i don't know but what i think is interesting is the what the belt contains um the pages of a tevinter manuscript that when found meaningful at a different time they list principles of the circle of Magi before public perception of magic was soured. So this tells me that even at the time of Dragon Age Origins, she's already rethinking some of her principles. She's already finding inspiration from a time before mages were oppressed. Um, and I think that that's really significant given the events of Asunder. And maybe I should rephrase what I said a little bit earlier, because I think you put it even better. Because um, I think she does, she does live by the rules, but with regard to her ideas on magic and mages, the, the principles she's holding to there aren't the standard societal anti-magic principles, but they are, they're still, you know, pro-mage, but in a different light generally than the, for example, the libertarian uh, faction or college. What's it called? Like everyone? Yeah, like the like each one of those groups, they're called something. Oh, the Sorry. fraternities, fraternities. Yeah. So it lining up with um, you know, she's the rule she holds by, they aren't exactly, you know, the anti-magic um societal views, but they also aren't really the the libertarian fraternity views either. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I think she very much takes a line of like because on one side you have to Venter's interpretation of magic is meant to serve man, never rule over him, where they interpret it as like, okay, we need to use it and we're going to use it unsupervised, basically. To you have the hardcore Templars who are like, okay, magic is meant to serve man, not rule over him. Let's shield everyone from it. Let's hide it away. Let's repress this. I feel like Wynn takes a very much more approach of like, Magic is meant to serve man, so let us serve, mm. you know, human. Let us serve Thetis. Let us be forces of good. Let us work to be examples of not all mages are going to end up abominations. Which is ironic, um, because she does. <laughs> but, no, I agree with you, and I think that that's a really great transition into my next point which is that Wynne very much always introduces herself and presents herself as the person who has the moral high ground. She acts like the mom character. She even takes it upon herself to lecture you multiple times. And she always is a person that thinks that she's right, which is why when you, when you can get into an argument with her, basically, like you're, it's very hard 
very hard to gain approval points from that. She's very convinced that she is always right, which can be very annoying, I think. But her most significant lecture of you comes when you and if your hero of Ferelden enters into a romance, if you do that with any of the companions. So she will basically tell you that the relationship is dangerous and she doesn't want to see you or the companion get hurt, depending on who you have a relationship with. Like if you um, are in a relationship with Zevran, she very much is like, I don't want you to get hurt. But if you're romancing Liliana, she'll say, I don't want to see Liliana get hurt, which I think is interesting, but um, ultimately when does encourage you to put duty first and pleasure second. And then in a later conversation, if you have progressed your relationship to the love point, she finally changes her mind on your ship and is like, I was wrong, but it takes the whole game basically to do that. I think that's so interesting because my biggest like thing with when I don't care about her being like, oh, you should put you know, your duty before of love or whatever. I was like, okay, you're just this person that's there. My biggest thing is that she tries to explain what it means to be a great warden to you. Well, that's my next point. Um... <laughs> I have something on this love conversation. Yeah, go ahead. Because uh, I just I just did this in my current playthrough of Origins. Um, she literally says that love is ultimately selfish, which I think is a very jaded and unhealthy approach to love but that makes a little bit of sense with her romantic history which we're going to talk about in a little bit um but i i get her point for you know saying hey you're trying to stop a blight it's not this is not important enough we're talking about the entire country and the entire you know all of thetis but and so don't get distracted but then for her to yield on that point when you actually are injured you know when you love your romance and it's not just a hookup I feel like that's almost should be counterintuitive because you know you know a a one-off thing isn't you know there's not a whole lot of investment there whereas when you say hey I love somebody if you believe love is selfish that should be approaching the the epitome of that selfishness of yeah maybe I would Sac, you know, not kill the archdemon in order to save my my romance, and it feels like those points should be flipped. See, I I see it kind of differently. I think that once you've progressed your relationship to love, like you have more of a reason to fight. Um, in most of the origins, like your family's dead, your friends are dead, or have been tortured, or like it's it's a bad situation and so like you finally found this group of people that care for you you finally found a relationship that means something to you so then if you love them you have more of a reason to fight the arch demon and save the world so that there's something for you to live for there is only one origin where your pe like people from your background are still alive well i think the city the dalish, elf, the dalish and the city elf have people alive still well technically the kuzland has her brother is still alive that's true um but most of her family is dead yeah if you and, but the even the city elf like tons of people die in the alienage yeah and the dalish your people eventually leave for mm -hmm. yeah yeah they do none so, of the origins none of the origins end on a happy note because why why would they though like if you are going to be this person who has to go and fight this arch demon like why would what would prompt you to leave if not tragedy right anyway so let's get to Wynn's beliefs on the gray warden since you brought it up austin so basically Wynn will encourage the warden to live up to the ideals of being a gray warden and embrace being a guardian of the people um, and she even like takes pride in the sacrifices of, of a gray warden and um, encourages you to as well because you help the people continue to exist. And she also does caution the warden to use your power and influence responsibly because your actions have a ripple effect on others um, and basically is like be considerate. A lot of people hate this conversation for the same reasons that people hate the conversation with Morrigan in Inquisition when you go to the Well of Sorrow, because it feels like 
they are mansplaining is not the right word, but that's the only word I have for it your own existence to you. Like if you are a gray warden, when is not, I think I would know more about being a gray warden than you would when you're not one. And same if you're an elf with Morrigan at the well of sorrows, like what, if you're Dalish, you know more than her. So I think that those are very two similar instances. Austin, I already know you're annoyed. So why don't you go ahead and give us your thoughts? Well, my only thing is like, if you haven't done it, take solace to the well of sorrows. And maybe it is just kind of the mom mentality that she takes with the group. But like, what is Wynn's position to talk to you about being a great warden? I think, you know, as a mage, especially as like someone who is in running to be a first enchanter, she has experience with sacrifice and and understanding what sacrifice means and what it takes to sacrifice yourself for a cause. But just the way she explains it, it's just like, oh, because I've read fairy tales, I know what it means to be a great warden. On that same note, it's similar to this conversation when she's, if you're a mage and she's asking you like, hey, how does it feel having left the tower? And you say, no, I'm totally happy. Like, I love being a great warden. She's like, that's great. But remember, no matter what, you're always going to be a mage first. No matter what you do, society is always going to see you as just a mage. So you better be prepared to deal with that. And it feels like a little bit harsh and too, you know, boxing, you know, in your identity as just, hey, once you're a mage, that is, you know, the the foremost part of your identity. And it doesn't, it I think is a good reflection of how she views the world and she views her own place in the world. I agree with that. Um, I also think that not that she has like a tendency to overestimate like her status, but again, I just think it comes back to the fact that she thinks very highly of herself. Um, same for Morgan, you know. <laughs> However, even though we may think of her as the goody two shoes mom friend, she hasn't always been a goody two shoes. She reveals to Alistair that she had an affair with the Templar in the circle, which bore her a son around 902 Dragon. As we know from the book Asunder, this son is Reese, who is like the main character of that book. And it is implied in the encyclopedia that the father of her child is Knight Commander Gregor, which I love that. Very I really hope the like hopefulness in me is hoping that he is just a Templar when that happens, and he is not Knight Commander at that point. I would imagine so. I mean, she's young, obviously, of childbearing years, so I can't imagine he would be the commander for that long. I feel like it humanizes Gregor a little bit more because it's like, okay, that gives us an indication that you don't you don't completely hate mages, or maybe at least you haven't always hated mages. Yeah, and I, I mean, I wouldn't I personally don't think he does hate mages. He's harsh, obviously, in Origins because he has to be. Like, he's convinced that there's a tower full of of demons. But I feel like you can tell that he doesn't want to have to resort to annulment. Um, He he gives you the opportunity to go in as the hero. So, um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I yeah, I also say like Gregor is among my top three favorite Templars, which one of them is an ex Templar, and when I love him the most is when he's not a Templar, which is Cullen. Um, but then Sir Barris and Gregor are my other two top favorite Templars. Why did I think you were talking about Samson? I don't know. I you know, I don't hate Samson. I used <laughs> to be really mad at Samson, but then you know, we did our deep dive on him on some episode i can't remember and then doing the research for cullen samson i understand samson i don't agree with his choices but i understand him all right well i think we are ready to head to our break austin all right let's do it enchantment enchantment you need me i am yours as always 
All right, welcome to the middle of the show where we talk about all things that don't have to do with the lore of Dragon Age, but have to do with this podcast. And the first thing I want to do is I want to thank our patrons, and I'll start that by doing our reading of our first patrons, which are Lisa M, Genesis, Derek B, and Zuba. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, we would greatly appreciate that. You can find the link in the episode description. You can sign up for various tiers. If you sign up for our first Enchanter tier, you can come on once a month and join us on the show. And it is great. I also have a new patron to thank, Courier Zero, who signed up as a new patron. Thank you so much for your support. And I really appreciate that. And yeah, another great way to support the podcast is to leave us reviews on Apple or Spotify. And if you leave us a five-star review on Apple with some words, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. If you don't use Apple, if you don't want to go on to Apple Podcasts, you can rate us on Spotify. And if you want to leave words and have it read out, you can email them to us, DM to us on Discord, DM to us on Twitter, and we'll get to it and we'll read them out that way. Um, we do have a new review to read today. All right. So this review is from LVCC13. And they say, everything I never knew about Thetis. Five stars. I absolutely love this podcast. I've learned so much about Dragon Age that I didn't know. And it makes playing the games even more fun. Austin and Shelby are so great to listen to. I've told all my friends who play Dragon Age to listen to this podcast. Five stars is not enough. Thank you so much for your review and for joining the Discord and for telling your friends about us. We absolutely love it when that happens. So thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And speaking of the Discord, that is a great way to come and hang out with us. You can join the Cups and More pod or Cups and Podcasting and more discord server i'll forget the name right eventually um you can find that link in the episode description you can come hang out with us talk about our other podcasts the assassin's creed lore cast the holocron histories podcast you can also come in and sh- talk about other games or share pictures of your pets or give Kolkashins a hard time about how he loves mages too much and i don't know do something like that you can come hang out with us have a lot of fun on the Discord. You can also join the Robots Radio Discord where you can find a bunch of other podcasts uh, to s- listen to. Lots of great stuff from you know, other lore casts like the Mass Effect lore cast or the Elder Scrolls lore cast. You can find them there or you know, radio dramas, all kinds of podcasts you can hang up to there. That link is also in the des- episode description. So yeah, you can join and hang out with us there. We are still doing our Show Us Your Heroes, Heralds, and Hawks I did that in the wrong order. Um, Heroes, Hawks, and Heralds is the right order for that. So we are still doing our show us your Heroes, Hawks, and Heralds. And we do have a new one to share today. So this Inquisitor, this Herald is submitted by Genesis. Thank you, Genesis. And this is her Inquisitor, Hera. Hera is a female Kunari Tempest Archer who successfully recruited and kept all of the fighters that wanted to join the Inquisition. The Iron Bull made a very big impact on her heart the moment that she saw him fighting on the beach in the rain. And they have remained together even after returning to the Winter Palace a few years after sealing the rift. Siding with the mages early on in the Inquisition made some party members wary, but in the end, the alliances built remained strong. When it came to who should be at the political head of Orlay, Hera decided that Selene could prove to be the best decision. Creating a political upheaval during a time of so many unknowns did not seem like a wise option. Exiling the Wardens also seemed like a poor choice from a military numbers standpoint, and even with the risk of corruption, Hera wanted the Darkspawn Hunters to remain on the field. When the party reached the Well of Sorrows, Hera herself took the knowledge and the consequences that would follow. When it came time to support a new divine, Liliana and her vast Chantry knowledge, progressive viewpoints, and history of being at the forefront of major battles, both physical and political, made the most sense to support for the position. Once things had settled down and began returning to normal, Hera wanted to see the Inquisition volunteers given the option to return home. 
When the events unfolded and the situation changed, she still wanted to work with a smaller faction of battle-honed hero of warriors, experienced teams of networkers and crafters. The Inquisition is now the personal guard of the divine and will continue to fight with less opportunity for outside security breaches. Thank you again, Genesis, for sharing your Inquisitor Hera. And if you are listening and want to see Hera, you can always hop in the Discord. Yeah, thank you so much. Lots of choices. I'm sorry, but Hera the Herald is the funniest thing I've heard all day. Well, wait till you hear about Austin's Inquisitor named Harold. <laughs> Harold the Herald. He is my favorite creation. He's a Kunari and he's bigger than Bull. Um, so yeah, the next thing we have is we have a big announcement about an upcoming change, which is that we are starting a new podcast. We are starting the Inheritance Cycle page by page podcast, a book club and discussion. We will be looking at the Inheritance Cycle or the Aragon books if you are like most of us who never bothered to learn the name of the series. Um, to be fair to us, it is not really advertised anywhere on the books. Um, so the Aragon books for the Inheritance Cycle, we'll be taking them chapter by chapter, two chapters a week. We'll be talking about them in in-depth analysis, reactions, and all kinds of stuff. And so you can come and hang out with us. Shelby is reading them for the first time. So you'll get her first impressions and opinions, which I think will be interesting. I already have theories on who her favorite character will be. Um, sadly, she will not meet that character until like chapter 38. Yeah. So you can. That's rude. You can guess on who will be her favorite character. So, yeah. So I'm just going to say this now. I can't promise that like once we get into the book, I'm not going to read ahead because I am not that kind of girl. <laughs> like I've got to have the freedom to read ahead. So, just so this is a good point. And we didn't talk about this on the Assassin's Creed lore cast, but this is a good point. We will have Discord channels, but please, if you're going to talk about it, try to spoiler tag and we'll put in there because she's told me she won't read the spoiler tags, but I don't trust her. I'll try. All right. So yeah, that'll be great. You can follow us on Twitter for already for that at uh, Inheritance page. And yeah, you can follow us there and it's a lot of great fun. We're very excited about it. So yeah, that's all I got for the mid break. Are you ready? Let's get back into it. All right, back to win. Well, that was uh, Orlesian. Dareth Shiran. Oh, you fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is bad. Okay, so we talk about Win having the moral high ground, right? Well, spoiler alert, I don't really think she has any moral high ground at all when it comes to magic and mages, because she's a literal abomination. Like she is an abomination. So if you advance your friendship with her high enough, eventually you will have an encounter on what's called the hillside path. And basically what happens is that when faints after the battle and she recovers pretty shortly after, and she reveals that she has a condition and that she's going to die. And you're like, what you what <laughs> and when you question her she reveals that in the initial battle in the circle tower she was actually killed a spirit at this time saved her and then entered her body making her an abomination in Wynne's words she is an abomination she calls herself that and she's living on borrowed time and she believes it's solely so that she can help the hero of Ferelden defeat the Darkspawn. So on that note, um, yeah, she definitely does call herself an abomination. But you're, there's an option for you, like before you find out that she has this spirit in her and she's trying to gauge your feelings on, for lack of a better word, spirit possession. There's an opportunity for you to essentially say, no, unless you're, you know, a mindless, empty vessel for this spirit and it controls every action, you're not an abomination. And she's like, you're right. You know, an abomination is defined by an inherent rage and violence. Um, so in, a, in the strictest sense, yes, I like to believe that there is 
a, a little bit of a gray room to say that she is not because she is still in control of her own decision making. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I and I definitely think we could get into the weeds here a lot. So I'm just gonna make this brief, but I think it's dependent on what kind of spirit you're possessed by, right? Like we see it look very different with Anders um, when he's possessed by justice. And I, I think about this all the time because I wonder what would happen if in Inquisition, there's a spirit of command that you can meet in Crestwood. And I always think about what that would be like to possess you um, I feel like it would turn into a demon immediately, like immediately. So I, I think it's very dependent on what type of spirit it is. Or would the Inquisitor become like one of the most, you know, butt kicking people out there that, that yeah. they could become amazing. Yeah. yeah. Or, the, you know, or worse than Corypheus, who knows? <laughs> right. Like the worst dictator in all of history. <laughs> it's interesting yeah. to me because like, so Anders corrupts justice because according to Anders, his anger create he underestimates how much his anger would influence justice to corrupt him. But when is possessed by a spirit of faith, and I would categorize when as a person of great faith, not only faith in like the maker and Androstianism and everything like that, but also faith in good, faith in mages, faith even in yeah, the system in yeah so yeah is, no, i very much agree with that is when different because when 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 is possessed she personifies what the spirit represents and therefore the spirit just you know amplifies those qualities in her it's more pure i also just think that when is less emotionally turbulent than Anders is and I think that that has a huge impact um huge impact and also I think that the spirit of faith is a stronger spirit than a spirit of justice um and Anders is the most emotionally turbulent character in DA2 and that is saying something I mean Fenris is up there I know you love him but he is no totally agree he's number two but not more than not more than not Anders. More than Anders, no. Um, so yes, Austin, you led me to my last point, which is that the spirit is supposedly a spirit of faith, but that's not confirmed by Wynne herself. And I don't remember exactly if it's explicitly confirmed in a sunder either. Um, but it is confirmed, hilariously enough in a mobile game, a mobile video game called Heroes of Dragon Age, which side note, Austin and I play a similar mobile game called um, Heroes of Star Wars. Galaxy and, of Heroes. Or Galaxy of Heroes, Star Wars. And so that's just funny to me. But in this mobile game, there is a spirit of faith in there attached in some way to win. I don't really know because I don't play the game. So that's kind of the way that it's revealed officially. I don't, I don't know. And I don't know the dates on like when Ascender came out versus when this bubble game started. So I could be a little bit off here, but I just think that's funny. This is kind of the last point I want to make before, we, so we can move on from the spirit because we still got all of Ascender to cover. Yeah. And, but my point is, it's kind of relating to Ascender. I wonder what would happen if someone tried to make Wynn tranquil. Like, because we know that, like, a spirit of faith touching your mind breaks tranquility. So could, is she immune to tranquility? Well, spoiler, we'll never know, but. She may be. I mean, honestly. Maybe Solus will tell me one day. I doubt it. Based on your playthroughs. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on from the spirit. And quickly, I just want to briefly mention this about Anarin. So after the incident with the spirit, you can ask Wynne more questions about the circle and all that kind of stuff. And she will basically tell you she's feeling some major regret over one of her apprentices, a city elf named Anarin. And she tells you that when Anarin was her apprentice, she was very hard on him and had high expectations. And so he ran away from the circle and the Templars chased him. And from this point on, Wynne assumed he had either been killed at the hands of the Templars or that he died, but she doesn't know for sure. And so the hero Ferelden can actually look for him 
and you can find him in the Brazilian forest. And then that allows Wynn to have reconciliation with him. And she apologizes for, for mentoring him badly. Um, and so she gets a little bit of closure that way. So what happens to Wynn after Dragon Age Origins? Well, first we can meet up with Wynn in Awakening. She can be encountered at the Chantry in Amaranthine. Um, also, interestingly enough, this Chantry's name is the Chantry of Our Lady Redeemer, which that is so Catholic. Like, I did that is that is so Catholic. I can't. I, I'm triggered by that. <laughs> um, anyway, at this point, when basically tells the ward commander, like, hey, the College of Magi is meeting to talk about the libertarians wanting to, to break away from the chantry. Um, and then she gives you a quest, whatever. And then she also appears in the Book of Sunder, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But before we do that, Cash is going to talk about her relationship with Shale. Yes. So there are, there's 10 years and this, her relationship with Shale leads into a Sunder because you know, both of them are in a Sunder. But the, the fifth blight, I believe, was 930 to 931. And then a Sunder begins in 940. Um, so... Well, she's doing some other things with the tower during that time. Um, she is also on a quest with Shale. This is a potential spoiler, but to reverse Shale's golem nature. I think this is very interesting because, you know, as we talked about, Wynne believed that she was living on borrowed time. And she, she thought that dedicating her life to fighting the Blight and the Darkspawn was, you know, the most worthy goal that she could find at the time. And, you know, she also, I'm sure, believes that being involved with circle politics is also important. But otherwise, she believes that the best use of her time for to some degree 10 years is helping a friend try to accomplish the impossible. Um, and I think it's, that is such a devotion and it's such a, a sacrifice because um, they said that they've had very, very little success with that. Um, two fun facts. First, when uh, explicitly genders Shale as a woman, despite Shale interjecting, I most certainly am not, which I don't know how exactly I feel about that because Shale identified as a dwarf woman before. Um, also, fun fact, per Asunder, it's now canon that both Wynne and Shale were present and involved at the Fade ritual at Red Cliff. For some of our listeners and maybe one of your hosts, can you remind me what that is? Where you go into the Fade to try to save Connor? So canon, you get shale before you do the Red Cliff ritual. Yeah, and uh, canon, you go to the circle before you go to Red Cliff. Right, so canon, like, I guess in that you would get, you are, you get the mages to come and do the thing, yeah. Yeah, and I think that makes sense, but I agree with you. It, it is very confusing to me that she referred to shale as a woman even though shale is like i'm not that that's not me um yeah i don't really like that very much either i guess from a like just a kind of like a different perspective could it be just the fact that shale doesn't remember much about who shale was before and that shale says that kind of before you you know you meet Keridan and you do Shale's quest and you learn who Shale was before they were a golem and you know maybe Shale's identity changes and Shale realizes that okay this is who I was before so I'll continue to identify that or it could be a thing of Shale saying that because Shale thinks that Shale is no longer who they were before they were a golem. I definitely think the memory loss plays the you know the most decisive factor in shale's self-identity yeah i agree but you know if shale comes in dad and says you know i'm not a woman i will not refer to shale as a woman it's the end yeah absolutely well let's move on to asunder a little bit so in asunder when appears 
as we know, we've talked about this book like infinitely ad nauseum on this podcast because it's so lore heavy. So when appears in the midst of the upheaval and turmoil after the events of DA2, right before the conclave, when is acting on the orders of divine Justinia and takes Reese, her son, Adrian, Evangeline, who is Reese's lover, will be whatever, Shale and Cole along well, Cole tags along to Adamant Fortress to save her friend Faramond. We discussed Faramond's story in episode one of season three. So check that out if you're interested in, in him. We're not going to talk about all the things that he does right now. But essentially after freeing Faramond, he tells the party he's discovered a way to reverse the right of tranquility and on the way back to Val Rio, when sends this information in like the equivalent of a mass email. She sends all this email, all this info about tranquility reversal to all 15 circles and divine Justinia. Seeker Lambert is furious, which makes me cackle. And the divine calls a conclave to discuss this information. So, like, this is the energy that I love about Wynn, because she basically just sends, like, a department email and then CCs, like, the boss boss. On <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is exactly what she does. Which is hilarious to me. It's so funny. Um, so, of course, they have, they have to have this huge gathering, right? And Lambert, of course, interrupts the, uh, the meeting. And like imprisons most of the first enchanters. When escapes along with Shale, Evangeline, and Liliana, they all return to the circle to help get those who are imprisoned out and to destroy a bunch of flactories, which of course Liliana is there for that. Also, Evangeline is a Templar, like, so this is a big deal for her. Anyways, at the end of a sunder. Evangeline is killed in a duel with Lord Seeker Lambert and when transfers the spirit of faith into Evangeline to revive her. This sacrifices Wynne's own life as the spirit is the only thing that was sustaining her. So Evangeline is revived and then at the end of that, Wynne dies. So the Dragon Age Keep is a liar. 100%. Because Wynn is not alive and well. 100%. But like, I think that it's so interesting because taking from the point of Wynn talking to the hero Ferelden and saying love is the most selfish thing in the world or whatever, to the point that she's in Asunder where she sacrifices herself for Evangeline because she loves his, her son to a point of like proving that love is not a selfish thing. Like that act of love is selfless. Also, is Evangeline just going to drop dead one day when the spirit finally gives out? Because Wen's always talking about, I can feel it getting weaker and essentially when it dies, I'm going to die. So what's going to happen to Evangeline when, when the spirit has to go back to the fade? I have no um, idea. I, uh, I, mean, I will say spirits of faith are the strongest spirits. So I kind of feel like when it was just saying that because she probably was tired or something. <laughs> <laughs> but also like, of course it goes to Evangeline. I don't think it could go to anyone else in that book. Um, it has to go to Evangeline. Why? I just think that she is the one that I don't think when would give the spirit to her if she didn't think that Evangeline would like exemplify what it means to be faithful i feel like no I, should, agree. I agree i agree with that and i think evangeline definitely does exemplify that but at the same time i mean it's it's a moment of necessity but i do think there's only one other person i think she would ever give it to and i would imagine if if you could ask when in the afterlife she would be surprised maybe somewhat surprised she gave it to evangeline but the only other person i could see her giving it to is is reese but I think she wouldn't. I also think there's another point of like maybe to save Reese's life. But like if there wasn't like death on the line, I don't think she would give it to Reese because I don't think she would burden him with that. That's fair. Another thing about this is like we didn't talk about this, but I want to go back to it because we talk about her stance at the conclave. 
And I do think that had not Lord Seeker Lambert acted in the way he did, I think that conclave would have gone very differently. Yes, I agree. I don't want to talk about him too much because people are roasting me. <laughs> I think anyone's upset about your stance on Lord Seeker Lambert. No, 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 not at all. Um, I do agree. I do agree that, and I think that if, I think that if Lambert had not been so extreme, I don't think Wynn would have blasted that information out to everyone. I think she felt like that was her only option. Right. And like, it's so interesting, like the echo effects. And, you know, I did this quest like a couple of days ago where it's Sebastian's quest um, in act three of DA2 where you meet Liliana. And Liliana basically says, like, the whole world, all of Thetis is watching Kirkwall. And when Kirkwall happens, and then the Ravani circle also happens, and just, like, Lord Seeker Lambert is at this point of just, okay, we're no more. Like, and that's his reaction. And I think it's also a point of his experience in Tevinter colors how he acts in asunder um but it's just that thing and like anders really did it like he said like that he says like this will mean that there will there's no more compromise and that's the result that kirkwall has on everything Mm -hmm. i feel like when she cares to your all's point she cares so much about stability and working small incremental changes within systems um, within those oppressive systems rather than large radical changes because she's afraid that it's going to cause you know mass violence and mass death to the detriment of society and to the mages which did happen but also her the approach of small incremental changes also was you know it led to the situation leading up to inquisition i definitely think you need both um and there's a time and a place for both but the issue in thetis is that there's only, well, I mean, there hasn't even really been compromise. There's been no change at all. Um, but anyway, so Cash, you wanted to talk also about the red staff from Asunder, right? Yeah, this is something that only appears very briefly in the book, but it stuck with me so much because I think this is, in my opinion, the only time that when really breaks her rules with the the spirit of faith and the potential question of being an abomination she's able to fit that within her rules but so when after when and evangeline escape um lord seeker lambert um when takes evangeline into the sewers of valrio valrio to retrieve this unique staff she had hidden there she literally rented space from a member of the local thieves guild to hide this there And Evangeline as a Templar immediately clocks this as quote unquote forbidden magic. The staff magically feeds off and amplifies Wynne's anger. It's Evangeline sees black black flames curled around Wynne that quote fed on her rage and drew strength from it, end quote. Also, she said she got this from the hero of Ferelden during the blight, but we never see it in the game at all. And this feels so contrary to i'm sure all of our canon you know heroes of ferelden but it's it's when resulting to it's not they don't explicitly call it blood magic but they call it dark magic and forbidden magic and it seems to go so it's it flies in the face of everything we know about when but the reason she's doing it is because she is livid with what with the templars and they have her son and she is willing to go to the utmost extremes to save her son, um, and you know who she, who was put up for adoption that she's not even super close with, but it's still he is that important to her. Now, thankfully, with a little bit of help from Evangeline, a lot of unwilling help, Wen is able to she's able to resist that dark temptation and overcome that. Are we ever confirmed? if this staff is made of lyrium no but i thought that was my exact thought too there's no it came out in what year did uh 
did Inquisition come out? Because I think the book came, uh, Sunder came out in 2011. Uh, so Inquisition is 2014? 14, 14. And I mean, I guess we already had, you know, the seed of the of the Red Lyrium from Dragon Age 2, obviously. But, I mean, could Red Lyrium have been around during Origins? Um, it's definitely possible. And there is a theory that the idol is a piece of a larger um thing i think we talked about this maybe in one of the dwarven episodes well it's very interesting to me because austin and i'm surprised you're not bringing this up because of the codex entry when you find the red lyrium idol it mentions a red lyrium staff as well right right so i wonder if this could be the red lyrium staff well if it was it's it's now destroyed right right which would make sense a little blip because what we know of the Red Lyrium Idol is that it amplifies kind of senses of paranoia and anger and basically drives you mad. So it'd be within reason to say that the Red Lyrium staff, this effect that it's having on wind would be comparable or similar to that. Yeah. But I do agree with you that this scene in the book is is out of character for her. Um, for sure. And I think that this is kind of the point like where we get when at the end of Asunder, which is that she has so much lost faith in the system of the circles and the Templars. The actions of Lambert in in that and just like experiencing talking with Reese and his experiences with Cole and everything like that and her own experiences with her own spirit like changes her and her she know by the end of asunder she no longer believes that the systems of the templars is going to work it's way out of character for her but i also think that it's it humanizes her even more she's no longer a goody goody two shoes she's not all high and mighty up on her big tall horse she is it she is knocked down to instincts that you know that everyone can relate to on some degree, you know, willing to do anything for for the people that you love. This is when coming back around to love is selfish. And, you know, it's it's it confirms that in a in a good way, I think, because it's important. That relationship to her is so important, even though it is it's not nearly as strong as she wants it to be with her son. I definitely agree with that. And I think that that line about love is a great segue into our next um, or almost next to last uh, subject in this episode. So her significant quotes and contributions, we've already talked about her contributions. So I brought one quote with me and I don't remember exactly where she says this in game, but I think this is a really good kind of summary of her outlook on life. So when says, People fear, not death, but having life taken from them. Many waste the life given to them, occupying themselves with things that do not matter. When the end comes, they say they didn't have enough time to spend with loved ones, to fulfill dreams, to go on adventures they only talked about. But why should you fear death if you are happy with the life you have led? If you can look back on everything and say, yes, I am content. It is enough. I like this quote because I think this is one of the most healthiest things we've ever seen someone say in Dragon Age. Yeah. And this quote, it comes from, I'm replaying Origins right now. It comes as she is talking about her own death at the circle and the hero is like, "Are what was it like? Are you afraid of death? And you, you know, how... What, it just it shocks the mind for him um but i agree with you i love this quote and i think it is so healthy and it um it i think it also it relates a lot also not only just you know your own life fulfillment but i think also mental health that um you know it's that that wasting life and focusing on the wrong things when it's you know go out and and have experiences and do as much as you can and you're no longer gonna you're not gonna worry about wasting life because you're out there living it if we ever get a live action or animated make of asunder i want this quote laid over lens when's last scene Mm, that would be amazing 
I hope they listen to this episode. <laughs> I hope they do too. Whoever they is. <laughs> but I just think that that characterization, like this quote is a perfect example of like foreshadowing of where Wynn ends up. Yeah, it is. Um, before we move on to our final wrap up, I also wanted to lift up Wynn has some of the best banter. Like she's hilarious. She teases Alistair like, so much she tries to give him the sex talk like it's hilarious that is my favorite companion banter from origins is when when is basically just like do you know where to put it like it's hilarious okay so we always end these episodes by asking the question where are they now and usually the answer is quantum or it depends well in this one she's dead sorry Um, (laughs) but i tell you she did but her ashes actually are buried beneath an ancient tree at andoral's reach in western orlay at the suggestion of liliana which i think is a nice touch um all right well let's close it out by answering briefly why do you love or hate this character at first when was not even on my radar i took her out because like you can't survive origins on any difficulty but easy without win in the party um unless you play a healer yourself so i got that but she didn't really leave a lasting impression on me um, I love a Sunder win way more than I love Origins win. Is my only thing. I can see why people wouldn't like her, especially like if you only play Origins and you don't read a Sunder. This kind of motherly figure um, definitely turned me off my first playthrough. I rarely talked to her. In my first playthrough, I was like, God, she is so old and she never shuts up about her age. Like, is this her whole personality? But I guess I'll take you along because I need you to heal me. She definitely, she has grown on me in the years since then. But I, I agree with you, Austin. I think the, I think Dragon Age Origins win alone is not, it's an incomplete picture. And it makes sense why people might not enjoy her that much. Having her, you know, from Origins to Asunder, it's a more complete picture. It shows a richer, more fuller, more detailed character and person. Um, but I, I also think, I like Wynn for this reason. I think I can see why other people don't like her for this reason, but where she, she, her position on mages, it's so it's, she's trying to protect mages from the outside world while also reminding mages of the danger they, they pose to the rest of society. And I feel like her and Vivian are very, very close to each other on on this issue and i think it's very similar reasons why people might not like vivian when it comes to mages yeah i agree with that i do think that that it's interesting that nobody seems to hate when the way they do seem to hate vivian like with passion um i think part of that's most of that is rooted in racism but that is another conversation for another day that will be coming soon Uh, yes teaser that's coming soon (laughs) um but i agree with both of y'all that like the first time i played origins i was like yeah when's meh she's fine i don't dislike her i don't love her like she's not my favorite person at all and then when i read asunder i was like oh wow like i don't know if she's changed or if if she always had this side of her but this makes me like win a lot more so for me still she's like not at the top of my list she's not my number one favorite character but she's definitely not at the bottom she's probably in the top third if not but the bottom part of that top third so she's you know she's a good character but not my favorite I think like with Wynn and one of the reasons I love her so much in Asunder is because of like kind of the nostalgia factor like she shows up and like oh it's Wynn like she knows what's up like it's almost like a sense of like you know when Gandalf shows up at the Battle of Helm's Deep, you're like, oh, everything's going to be okay now. It's like the thing, oh, Wynn's here. She's a veteran of the Fifth Flight. Everything's going to be okay. Um, Because that kind of sense there. And that's why Asunder ranks high in my uh, favorite books is because with that, it then connects into like the games of the series without like being background. Kind of like that's how I feel about Mast Empire a little bit until you get to like, the end epilogue 
ish ish part of Mass Empire is that it's kind of set up as background, but when being present for Asunder ties it into the overarching like story of the games for Thetis. Yeah, definitely. Well, I don't have anything else, Austin, so. All right, well, that's all we got. So thank you for listen- listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I don't have anything to plug, but I just want to say how much I enjoy this podcast, how happy I am and appreciative I am to, to get the invite to join you all to talk about when today and everyone keep listening to their podcasts, listen to the uh, to their inheritance podcast, listen to any of their podcasts and join the discord, join the Patreon. It's a great community and you will absolutely love it. I promise you that. Thanks for the shout out. Yeah, thanks. All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at DALorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. Have you ever wanted to deep dive into the lore and stories behind all your favorite Marvel movies? Then do we have the show for you. I'm Captain Shanko. And I'm Psych88. Join us as we dissect the media megalith that is the MCU. We'll talk about the origin stories, the fights, and everything in between. The MCU Lorecast releases on all major podcasting platforms on Mondays as part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club and can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.